I'm going to be the speaker today, and um, I'm going to do something quite unusual with you guys or different, and I really feel like the Holy Spirit has told me to do this, so I'll explain what I'm going to do shortly, but um, I, some of you may know I, I, I work part-time for the church and do something else the, as well, and that is I'm an advocate, okay, and um, so I feel like the Lord has told me to make an argument, and then I'm going to preach a bit after that. But before I get there, people say, well, how can you be a, a pastor and, a, and an advocate at the same time? And, and I say, well, I, th I think it's important to understand that there have to be double agents. <laughs> Work for both sides. But seriously, effectively, I see it as the same thing. Because when I, as a pastor, I'm here trying to help people to escape judgment. As an advocate, I'm trying to help people to escape judgment. The difference is that some of my clients, as an advocate, are innocent. All of you are guilty. Bible says, all of you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. See, does that make sense? So, so I don't tell guys what to say. I don't make stories up. If they have ridiculous stories, I tell the court their ridiculous story. Hey, see, guilty. So all of you are guilty. All of you are guilty. And so, but, but for the grace of God, you'd all, you, you're all meant to go, fall under God's judgment and go to hell. And that's important, is that the grace of God is why you're going to heaven and not falling under judgment. So, <clears throat> now, effectively what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an argument about certain charges that people level against God all the time. And I want you to guys to really listen. And if you agree with me, then I'm going to preach to you a bit after that. Are, are you up for it? Do you think I can make an argument? Okay. The charges are that the normal accusations that people make against God. If God is so powerful, why are people going hungry? If God is so powerful, why is there war and sin? If God is so powerful, why didn't he stop this? If God is so powerful, come on, help me. If you've all had people say, say things like this. If God is so, if, if there's a God, then why are you sick? If God is so powerful, why are there children who get injured and hurt and, uh, and have terrible diseases? Have you all heard those charges? Now, I'm going to make an argument to you why God is not guilty of that whatsoever. Are you ready? Okay, you need to listen. Now, the problem is, is that we don't, I believe that the, that the, the chief problem is, is that we, 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 we taught that God is omnipotent. What does omnipotent mean? Unlimited power. And is he all-powerful, completely powerful? Of course he is. Of course God is omnipotent. But the, the bottom line is, and I'm going to prove to you, that he, that he limited his power in certain ways. First of all, he limits his power by his promises and his word. So he doesn't move outside his word. If he's, if he's said something, he's going to fulfill it. That's his word. The next is, is that his, his nature and character is limited by his nature and character. So he's not Machiavellian. In other words, he doesn't do whatever it takes to get whatever he needs to do done. Why? Because he's, he's, he's God. He doesn't lie. So he can't lie to get stuff done. Another example is that he's is that he set up spiritual rules that he, that he can't break. He, he will not break. 
So he's limited how he uses his power. Another thing is that he's, and this is maybe the most important point that I'm going to make to you, he's limited his authority by delegating it to people. So, you say, well, has God really limited his authority, limited how he uses his power? Well, the, the most obvious the most obvious example of God having to stick to the rules is salvation. Now, let's look at it. The Bible says we've all sinned. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So, so, how, did, so how did God set about trying to save us? He took His most precious, precious, precious Thing in, in his life, his son. And he gave his son to go down to earth from the throne of glory, go down to earth and be murdered when he's innocent. Now, we would say, well, if God is so big, why didn't he wave his finger and remove all our sin? Isn't that the law? If, if he was omnipotent and didn't stick to any rules, isn't that the obvious way to go? Hey? If it, if it, let's be honest. If you were all powerful and didn't have to stick to certain rules and principles, then, and your son had to be sacrificed for the sins of others, wouldn't you just want to wave your finger and make something happen? Remo let's, I, I speak forth that thou shalt sins be removed. If he, could, if he could put the universe in place by the power of his words, why couldn't he just speak forth and say, sin be removed? It's because, he's, because, it's because his power is limited, is limited by his holiness, his character. So he couldn't just wave a finger and say, you guys are all saved. He had to sacrifice his son. He had to turn his back on his son to achieve salvation for you. Does that make sense? Next point. Before that, he had to, before he sent Jesus, he had to build up a knowledge and understanding of who Jesus was going to be before he could send him. Because if Jesus had arrived and there, there wasn't a thousand years of practice and a thousand years of, and a thousand or two thousand, a thousand years of practice and two thousand years of prophecy that Jesus was going to come and the sacrificial system, everybody would have dismissed Jesus as a madman. So that, that's, you, you know. Our, we read the, the, one of the big mistakes we make when we read the, 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 all, the, the Bible as a whole is we don't picture it. We just read it as words. So we read things like, and they sacrificed 3,000 lambs and 5,000 5, 5, um, cattle and all of that. And we go, geez, that's a lot. Except that we don't think about what it looked like while that was happening. Who here wants to go spend some time at an abattoir? If an abattoir killed that many animals in one day, can you imagine the filth, the stench, the screaming, the crying, the, the, how horrific it would be? Why, why were they sacrificing? Why were they sacrificing doves? Didn't they know about pigeons? This beautiful white, white, white bird, beautiful color of white. Why sacrifice something that beautiful? It's because they needed to understand this, that the sacrifice was going to be that bloody, that terrible of such an innocent, innocent thing. It was, a, it was a visual sermon day after day, week after week, week, year after year, century after century of how terrible their sin was. And how 
terrible the judgment they would face unless they come to Jesus, unless they accepted Jesus when he came. And, and, the, and it also was an illustration of how terrible their sin was. Imagine seeing these animals slaughtered like that. It's, in fact, if you go look at the book of Jonah, one of God's big gripes about Jonah was he was going to have to destroy Nineveh, and he didn't want the animals to die. So God doesn't, it's not that God doesn't care about animals. It's just that the power of sin is far greater than we necessarily understand. And to remove that sin just a little bit, just out of the way for a short while so that there could have been a relationship with God, there had to be terrible sacrifice. And that paled in comparison to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Then, then let's have another look. We pray here for healing. And who was here in that service when about two-thirds of the church had testimonies of incredible healings? We think, oh, healing is great, and we wipe, you know, hallelujah, healing is fine, hallelujah, pray, that guy gets healed. But why do we have healing? Did God, did, did God just swing his wand around and say, that there shall therefore thou be healing? No. Jesus had to sac sacrifice how many stripes? 49 stripes. 39, that's what I thought. 39 stripes. Actually, I couldn't remember if it was 49 or 39. That's why I asked you guys. And then someone said 49. Don't oh, worry, I was also confused. 39 stripes he paid so you could be healed. So if God was all-powerful and he is omnipotent, if he wasn't restricted by rules, why didn't he just swing his ma magic wand around and say, you will be healed? He had to watch his most precious posses possession get whipped 39 times with, a, with, with, with a, a whip that had metal and glass and stones in it. He had to, be, he had to watch his son be flayed to the very edge of his life so that you could be healed from a cold or cancer or AIDS. So he didn't just, he, he, he didn't just say, oh, that's the way it's going to be. He said, he, he sent his son to pay for your healing. Why did God have to, why did Jesus have to pay for your healing with sacrifice if God has absolute carte blanche to do what he likes. Then the next thing is, God, if there's a God, why is there so much evil in the world? Well, let me read you Genesis 6.3. Genesis 6.3. Let me actually take some more. Actually, actually, before I get to Genesis 6-3. Now the question is, why, if, if God could do what he likes, why did Jesus have to come as a man? It would be like Bill Gates' son coming to live in the poorest place in DRC. That's And that wouldn't even be close to how much of a step down he expected Jesus to have. Imagine living in the glory of heaven, something that we can't even express, something that we can't even understand, something that, that's beyond anything we can understand, and being restricted into the, t into the womb of a woman for nine months. Who here wants to go back into the womb? <laughs> we have psychologists who can help you, but because um, I want you to know you don't fit, but... Um, Imagine, imagine the incredible oppression of being restricted in a womb when you're God. Why did God have to do that? 
if God was all powerful, why didn't he send Jesus down at the age of 30 and say, go and die, preach a bit and go die and rise again? He couldn't do that because it had to be because Adam was a man who had failed. He had to send his son as a man. Why? God stuck to certain principles and rules that he had set up. He didn't ignore them. He had to adhere to them to purchase our salvation. So Jesus couldn't be, couldn't be beamed down by Scotty at the age of 30. He had to be restricted to the womb of a woman. He had to be breastfed. Imagine the king of glory, breastfed. And when Jesus agreed to this, he knew he would have to do that. That's how, that's how, how much he had to descend. Why did he do that? Because God has set up certain rules and restrictions, and he cannot, he cannot, he cannot break them. So we say to God, well, where... So, so, so God, so, so, although God is omnipotent, He has restricted His power. Then let's look at this. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they're only mortal flesh. In the future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. Incidentally, science tells us at the age of 120, Humans die automatically. They don't have to get sick. There's no disease. Roughly 120, it just all stops. And so why did God restrict the life? So people say, well, why is there so much evil in the world? What is God doing about it? What he's doing is he he restricted our lifespan. Where does the evil come from? The evil comes from us. Through the power of Satan harnessing us. And God knew that if he let Hitler live for 400 years, there would be nothing left. If he left left Idi Amin for 400 years, there would be nothing left. And so one of... One of the best ways to restrict sin is to restrict people's lifespan. So you say, God hasn't done anything about sin. Yes, He has. He made you live shorter. <laughs> you see, this is one of the, ru- one of the laws. He doesn't... One of the spiritual rules he set up is he doesn't take us over and run us like robots. So he doesn't step into Idi Amin and stop him. He can't. So he makes Idi Amin or whoever, he says, enough is enough. I can't cope with the sin, with these unlimited, these 900-year lifespans. I'm cutting it down to 120. So God has done something about sin. He made you live shorter. Another interesting point is that there were people praying in the temple for Jesus to come. Were they wasting their lives? Was Jesus going to come anyway? No, I believe that they had to be praying in the temple for for the Messiah to come, for the Messiah to come. And I'm going to get to, I'm going to explain why I say that in a little bit. But another, before I I make this last point, and I'm going to refer to Exodus 32 verses 9 to 10. Exodus 32 verse 9 to 10. Now, what happened was, was that God wanted to marry Israel, come into incredibly close relationship with Israel, at Mount Sinai. That was what it was all about. But they went, they, they rejected him, they went up, they received the law, Moses received the law, and he came back, and he found Aaron and all his children 
all the children of Israel that God wanted to come into relationship with worshipping a golden cow. And let's be honest, they were way out there in the desert. It was probably a really ugly golden cow. The only reason anyone knew it was a golden cow is because they told them that it was a golden cow. What's that thing with four sticks sticking out of it? It's a cow. Let's worship it. Come on, they weren't, you know, in the movies we see these beautiful cows. Let's be honest, they didn't have the equipment to, be, to make a beautiful cow. It was a golden cow, and it was ugly, and no one really knew what it was, but they all say that's a golden cow, so worship it. So then, so, 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 so then God says, now remember in Genesis 12, 2 and 3, he had promised his, his son Abraham. What did God promise in Abra Abraham in Genesis 12, 2 and 3? I will make you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll bless those who bless you. And all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So let's read Genesis. So, so, so Moses comes down and God is furious. Because there he is. There's this mountain. There's cloud. There's lightning. There's thunder. And the Israel, Israelites get too scared of God because he's too big for them. So what happens? They start worshiping this golden cow. And then God says to Moses... Then the Lord said, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Next verse. Now leave me alone so my fierce anger can blaze against them, and I will destroy them. Then I will make you, Moses, into a great nation. So why did God want to turn Moses into a great nation and obliterate the rest of them? Because he had made a promise to Abraham. If he had obliterated everybody which is honestly our inclination, he, his word that he would make Abraham into a great nation could not come to pass. So he, he said to Abraham, I want to kill all of these people. I'm going to keep my promise through you. And Abraham says, no. And do you know what? God didn't obliterate Israel. Why? Because Abraham said no. He wasn't prepared to agree to the promise that God was wanting to make him. That's crazy, isn't it? Okay, let's turn to Matthew 21, verse 33 to 44. Matthew 21, verse 33 to 44. Now listen to another story. This is a, Jesus telling a parable, and he's, and he's explaining the principles of the kingdom. A certain landowner who, in the, and let me break the suspense now, that landowner represents God. Okay, so read the landowner as God. So a certain landowner planted a vineyard, built a wall around it, dug a pit for pressing out the grape juice, built a lookout tower, then he leased the, the so that's before we get to the lease. So he made, the, the, the garden represents the earth. He made the earth perfect, perfect for sustenance, perfect for everything. Then he leased the vineyard to tenant farmers, religious leaders as, as well as us, and moved to another country. In other words, moved off to heaven and left us here to take control of the earth. At the time of the grape harvest, he sent his servants to collect his share of the crop. Sounds like tithing. Now, no, seriously, it's, it's tithing. But what happens? Now, who were these servants? These servants were the people he raised up. Because remember, this is Jesus speaking at the time, and he's speaking about the prophets. He's speaking about Moses. He's speaking about Abraham, but especially the prophets who were all killed. But the farmers grabbed his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. These were the prophets that God had said, you need to serve God. You need to tithe. They killed them all. 
very accurate. Next verse. Oh, it is the next verse. So the landowner sent a large group of servants to col collect for him, but the results were the same. They killed that group as well. Finally, the owner sent his son thinking, surely they will respect my son. Next verse. But when the tenant farmers saw his son coming, they said to one another, here comes the heir to this estate. Come on, let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves. My dad was speaking about greed just earlier. The, we were greedy. When Jesus came along, we were like, we are not going to listen to this oak. We want to do what we like. Let's kill him. And what did they do? They killed Jesus. This was Jesus foretelling his death. Let's, next verse. So they grabbed him, dragged him out of the vineyard, and murdered him. Next verse. Then the owner of the vineyard returns. Jesus asked, what do you think he will do to those farmers? Next verse. The religious leaders replied, he will put the wicked men to a horrible death and lease the vineyard to others who will give him his share of the crop after each harvest. Incidentally, what happened was, was that although there are lots of Jewish people who are saved, ultimately the church has been given to the Gentiles. It's because we've accepted the gospel far more than they are. There's, there's a, and we're trusting for a move of God for Jewish people, and there are Jewish people who serve God, but ultimately the church is now a Gentile church. Next verse. Then Jesus asked them, didn't you ever read this in the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it's a wonderful state to see. Um, so, what we have here, so what we have here is, is we have, the earth has been leased to us. Now, you guys all, who has ever rented a house from anybody? Who does the house belong to? But can the owner come in and do what he likes? Not at all. Why? He's given you control over that house. He, in most lease agreements, the owner can really only come in with your permission. So, of course, please don't take this as legal advice at this point, because you need to read your lease. But in most, most leases... In fact, I, in, fact I, I, um, in the court every day, there are landowners who are, owned, who are owed rent, who are battling to get rid of tenants. I, know, I had one client who, um, who, who guy wasn't paying his rent, so he came in and said, I have to do repair on this front door. And so he took the front door off. And then when the guy didn't move, he said, I have to do repair on this roof took the roof off. <laughs> also not legal advice. <laughs> the point is, is the guy was desperate to get rid of his tenant. Why? Because the tenant had farm... Sorry, let me... The tenant had to do all kinds of things. Uh, the landowner had to do all kinds of things to get rid of the tenant because the tenant effectively had the say-so over the leased property. And that's the point I'm trying to make to you, you here, guys, is that the tenant has the lease over the vineyard. You have the say-so over the earth. So when, when, when people have towers and they wail from towers, they're not just irritating you. They're opening the door for the devil. One of the big things why God was so angry with Adam is he, he told him to protect the garden, and Adam let the devil in through the snake. That's why Adam was, was, was in more trouble than Eve. The bottom line is, is that there are people around the world praying right now for the devil to have control over our earth. M billions. 
on Friday, they all got together and prayed. Some of them are out there. In, there's all the, the other foreign religions, the, 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 the religions that don't worship the one true God. What are they praying for? They're praying for the Satan and his demons to have their way here on earth. There are people who are, are having all kinds of, of, of they slaughtering things, they're doing all kinds of things to open the door for the devil. That's why prayer is so important. Prayer is absolutely vital. Prayer is absolutely central because it's the tenant saying, come in and fix our place. Come in and fulfill what you wanted for this, your property, O oh God. And then you've got the oak next to you going, come in, Satan, and destroy everything. Of course, he doesn't fully understand what he's doing, but there are actually some people who really do pray that, from what I hear. But we have the heathen praying like crazy for, for, for there to be death, destruction, to, for the Satan to have his way here on earth. And those prayers are not, they're not useless. They have a function, and the, the function is to allow the devil to have his way. So all, you, all us prayerless Christians who never ever pray, the oaks are praying seven times a day. They're opening the door wide, aren't they? That's crazy if you start to think about it. And so... I put it to you that instead, of, that instead of us saying, God, why is there so much hunger? On Judgment Day, I believe that God's going to say to us, why were there so many hungry people? Instead of say, God's, us saying to God, why is there so much evil? He's going to say, I, I, put, I gave you this earth. I restricted myself. I sacrificed my son. I did whatever it took to help you. And yet there was so much evil in the world. What did you do about it? What were the other charges of forgotten? Why is there so much sickness? You'll say, I sacrificed my son with 39 lashes so that you could be healed. Did you believe my word? Did you take my word and pray for the sick wherever you could find them? Did you pray for the sick? Do you understand what I'm saying? We, we, the problem is, is we've been pointing our finger at God. He's going to say, well, why? We say, why is there so much evil in the world? God's going to say, didn't you see I restricted your lifespan? I restricted the amount of sin that could get in here. I did what I needed to do. But did you do what you needed to do? Did you harness my omnip omnipotent power that I put at your disposal to change the world and how it's run? Did you do that? You see, unfortunately, all the accusations that we are going to do to point, to point our finger at God, is actually the charges that are going to be leveled against us. And, and I'll show you the parable of the, of the, the parable where, where um, of the, uh, I've forgotten what it's called, but what happens is uh, the, 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 Jesus says to him, when I was sick, you didn't visit me. When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I had no clothes, you didn't clothe me. And that's and we say, God, well, why aren't they clothed? So, well, I'm not sitting in heaven making clothes. That it comes through us. We have the power of the omnipotent God to harness to get these things done. And unfortunately, He's delegated this authority to us to harness to do what needs to be done. So the charges are not, so, so I, I'm going to ask you now, 
Who is guilty of these crimes? Is it God? Or is it us? The human race. Have I convinced you? Okay. Now, let's get to, let's turn to Ecclesiastes 9 verses 11 to 12. So I, I, I believe I've convinced you, I've made a decent argument. You all, I think, agree with me. Let's, let's get to, so how does this actually work for your life? Ecclesiastes 9 verses 11 to 12. Okay, I've observed something under the sun. The fastest runner doesn't always win the race. The strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle. The wise sometimes go hungry and the skillful are not necessarily wealthy. And those who are educated don't lead success, always lead successful lives. It is decided by chance by being in the right place at the right time. People can never predict when hard times might come. Like fish in a net or birds in a trap, people are caught by sudden tragedy. So we blame God for our sudden tragedy, but we, he's set up the vineyard. He's put everything that needs to be there at any time we can call him in. But ultimately, there's lots of people calling Satan in, and so horrible stuff happened to people. Can we blame God? Well, as an example, um, there was a, about two weeks ago, I don't know if any of you saw there was a little article about the Austra- how the Australians addressed, arrested a guy and that there was going to be a terrible a terror attack there. Did any of you see it? Now, what, what, what they didn't report on is that Cindy Jacobs put out an international prayer request right across the world to pray for Australia because a terrorist attack was coming, and a day later someone was arrested and the terror attack stopped. Why didn't God himself come and stop that guy? Because he can't. He's delegated the vineyard to us. In that case, someone heard the Lord. Someone heard what he had to say. He prayed and God could, they prayed, not he, she. She prayed, we prayed, and God intervened and rescued Australia. So, unfortunately, because of the decisions we've made, we've brought the devil in. And it, if it isn't you, then it's the guy sitting next to you or the guy in, next door to you or the guy in, in Syria or whatever. They've brought the devil in, and so terrible things can and, and sometimes will happen in our lives. Say, so, well, if, is God in control? Let's, let's look at how he does it. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 2 verses 6 to 10. Paul speaking about 1 Corinthians 2, 6 to 10. Yet when I am among mature believers, I do not speak the words of wisdom, but not the kind of wisdom that belongs to this world or to the rulers of the world who are soon forgotten. No, the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God, His plan that was previously hidden, even though He made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. But the rulers of the world have not understood it. They have, they, if they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. That is what the Scriptures means when they say, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. So although the world is full of terrible things and, and people make decisions to allow the devil in and do all kinds of things, God is able to chart a way through it. So let's look at what Jesus did. God knew that the kings of the princes of the world would, would want to kill Jesus. Who were the princes of the world? The demonic spirits, the demonic strongmen in that area wanted Jesus dead. And so God, even though, and, 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 he, and God knew that there would be enough people cooperating 
with the demon spirits that Jesus would die. Now, what's important is, is they tried to kill Jesus several times, but each time God intervened to stop it because it wasn't the right time. But ultimately, God's plan was to use what the, the princes, the demons, were wanting to do to destroy Jesus to set all of you free. So, they are th so, so if, if God does that with Jesus, and he used the, the plan of Satan to, take, to make something even more special and something more powerful, then what doesn't God do in your life? There are things that happen to you that you did not want to have happen. There are terrible things that people did. People allowed Satan in, and they abused you, or they hurt you, or they were careless and you were injured. Or people failed you, or people didn't listen to you. And they did terrible things. And you say, where was God? Well, God knew that these things can and will happen, and he took those things that happened to you. He took those things that have happened to you and he incorporated it into his mysterious plan to take you into blessing. So, so is there sickness in the world? Yes, it was introduced through sin. Some of you may have got sick, but God has miraculously healed you. And he's t used that to fulfill his plan for you. Some of you have been abused. Some of you have been pushed down. Some of you have, some of you have, sick, have, have some of you, your, your mother or your father have rejected you. God, in his mysterious plan, is going to incorporate all of those things that happened because of the sin that was let loose in the world. And he's going to work it out for your good, for the blessing. That's how God operates. He, at times, uh, often he will speak to us and we'll ignore him and the thing will happen because we didn't pray. But God is working whatever situation you have as long as you stayed plugged into him into something beautiful and special. So irrespective of... So for instance, this church... We, we were persecuted because of the move of the Holy Spirit way, way back, and because we were a multiracial church from about 1978. We were terribly persecuted. We were dragged through the courts. We went through a terrible time. Why? Because people had allowed Satan into their hearts. But God took that, and he turned it into this. Nineteen branch churches across our city I have a many men, I have a many men on the, on the turning point encounter. You guys running connect groups and, 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 um, and caring for people and praying for people. God took what was a terrible, horrific situation in our lives and he made it something special so that when people drive past here, they can't say it's us, they have to say it's God. And so I'm here to preach faith into you. Whatever has happened to you, whatever difficulty you've gone through, if you hand it over to Jesus, he's going to make something special of it because he's incorporated the things that happened to us into his plan to bring it out for your good. And ultimately, his plan for you is blessing and he will use even what the devil means for your destruction to take you to a higher level. And so I want to challenge you here today. I want to challenge you to not let go of, of God, not let, let go of the, move, of, of, of the Holy Spirit working in your life, whatever has happened to you, God is working it right now for your good. 
for the good of the people around you, and for the good of your life so you can serve God better, love God better, and meet Him one day in heaven. And so I'm not here to say there won't be hardships because clearly because of the level of sin that's been allowed into our world, there will be bumps and bruises and even horrible things that happen. But God is using each of these things for the good. And the mistake people make is when things go wrong or when things go right, they, they let go of God and they, and they, and they scupper. What's the word? You know, when you sink a ship, um, yeah, you scupper, you, you, you take the ship out into the bay and you blow the bottom out. And that's what people do again and again and again. They literally sink their lives because when good or bad things happen to them, they leave God and they leave the process that God is working out through his incredible mysterious plan and they destroy it. And then they say, well, where was God? Well, where were you? So I'm not promising you a perfect life. I'm promising you a life where God uses each of the hardships that come in through the sin that is, that is layered upon layered upon layered in, your, in this world where, where you get damaged as a result of it. That God will use that for your good and work out an incredible plan. I'd like everyone to bow their heads. If you've, if you've never understood God's plan for you, if you've never understood that you need to be part, part of Jesus, there are two altar calls I'm going to take, make now. The first is if you've never, ever been, if you've never, ever, ever given your heart to Jesus or if, if you've lost your faith because something has gone wrong and, and, and you're far away from God right now, and you've now, you now understand how important, how God wants to work it out for your good and how important it, it, it is to stay connected to Jesus. I want you to raise your hand up now and say, please pray for me. I know the Holy Spirit is speaking to people. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, raise your hand now, please. Thank you, Lord. I see that hand. Thank you, Lord. I know, I, I know that God wants to heal people, help people. Thank you, Lord. See two hands up there. Last chance. Raise your hand up now and say, pray for me. I need to be connected, reconnected to God. Thank you, Lord. Last chance. I, I see a hand there. Thank you, Lord. Last opportunity. There are about four people that have raised their hands. I want you to come. Please come stand in front of me and face me here. We're not, gonna, we're not going to embarrass you. I'm going to pray for you. Then we're going to have people help you. Please come forward if you've raised your hand. Thank you. If you raise your hand, please come. Thank you, Lord. Please don't waste this opportunity. And then there's a second altar call I want to take. And if you raised your hand for the first altar call, I want to encourage you to not sit in your bench, but come down. We want to pray for you. If you are here and, and you serve the Lord, but you, there's something that you're battling with, something that's happened to you, and you don't understand it, and you don't understand what's going on, I want, to encourage, I want you to raise your hand now and say, I am battling, I love the Lord, but I need, I need the strength to, to see me through this difficult time. Because all of us will go through it at some point. There we go. If you'd rather just come forward, come stand here. I know there are a number of Christians at the back there. Come. If you've raised your hand, just come forward over here. Could I have altar workers here? And I'd like pastors to come pray for people over here. You love the Lord, just going through a tough time. Come stand over here. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord. Come, I know there are more than two people going through a tough time. Battling, you need help from the Holy Spirit. If you are, if you've given your life to Jesus, then that side, um, if, if, if you've never given your life to Jesus, that side, if you're battling, come stand here. Are you over here? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Okay. This is, I'm going to pray for this group, and then I'm going to pray for that group. And if you're in neither group and you need to be, get here now. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, praise the Lord. Father, I come before you, and I thank you for these people. I thank you, Lord, that you have a plan and purpose for them. Thank you, Lord, that part of your great, incredible, mysterious plan for them was to bring them here to, today. I thank you, Father, that they are going to come into your family that it's not just going to be head knowledge, but heart knowledge of, the, of how God, much God loves us. I pray for each of these people, Lord. I bless them, Father God. I bless each of them, Father. I know, Father, that you have a plan, that whatever has happened to them, Father God, you're going to use for their good because you have a plan and purpose for them. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Okay, guys, please follow Matthew through there. We're going to have, someone's going to pray with you, explain what's happened, take your details. And then I'm just going to quickly pray for these guys. Father God, I thank you for each of these guys. I thank you, Lord, that you have a plan and purpose for them. I thank you, Lord, that where they're going through hard times, that you're going to strengthen their faith, that they are going to believe God, that they are going to know God, that they are going to come into a relationship with you. And I thank you, Father, that whatever has happened, we know that you have a plan and a purpose for it. We know that you want to work all things for their good. And we come into, we come into faith and we believe it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay.